symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Yeah, no, no, I got, I got it, I got it. Here we go. I'm channeling, channeling my Tony Schiavone. Shoot house promo with Alex Savage, you know, so put that into it too. Shoot house uh, podcast promo with Alex Savage. Uh, you're pointing, at, stop pointing at the wrong camera, damn it. <laughs> this camera, all right. God, professionals, all right. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Shoot House podcast, and this is Roxas Mason or Vincent, and we're here today with IPW champion. Well, I think he's a champion. He should be a champion for God's sake, um, Alex Savage. So, how was the podcast? How was the podcast, Vinny? Yeah. How was the podcast? Is this how you introduce me? A champion who you think should be champion. I'm not a champion. Are you trying to rub it in that maybe I've never been up for the IPW championship? Maybe I've never ever had that opportunity and you just wanted to get a little subtle dig in there? <laughs> I'm just doing my job. Like it, I, it's just be determined. Come on, did, you know you can. I know you have the talent, but I'm you know, just saying. I haven't seen the step around you anytime soon. I'm just saying. Bro, let's see. Well, what's up, man? How's it going, Vinny? Good, good. How was your day? Not too bad. Yeah, we just met each other in class. So how was your, you know, your progress in your morning? Uh, pretty good. We're going through project planning at the moment, which uh, I would say is um, one of my less, least favorite things that we do in class. Um, but, you know, so I'm still personally trying to get my head around that. But uh, I do think that there is value in that stuff. So it's good to, um, to work through it. Absolutely. I remember working on that three years ago and just going, I don't understand what this means or what a gun chan is. So it's good to get a good breather on that, you know? Yeah, and hopefully uh, we're doing it in such a way that everything seems to... Uh, we're, we're simplifying it to the point that everything makes sense because I do think that stuff is pretty dense. Um, you know, there's just, like, essentially making... Overcomplicating things is a problem, uh, which I think is, you know... Um, especially in certain uh, IT stuff is quite a quite a common problem and I just think that like this stuff has got good practical use but it feels hard to grasp because of all the words that are used to essentially say you know basic things yeah yeah it, it, it just overcomplicate things and it just makes it hard yes yeah. yeah well going to uh, basically uh flip over that in terms of like scheduling and whatnot how was it like to be an indies wrestler um well so uh, i mean for me i've been wrestling for uh about six years now or, or f maybe five years i started training six years ago oh. um and so i started very late i started uh training to be a wrestler at 34 i'm 39 now which is like about as late as you can start wrestling uh if you hope to be able to to wrestle and not um, kind of hurt yourself, uh, you know, just, you know, obviously the body is not designed for pro wrestling really, but the older you are, the harder it is to recover and the worse that it sort of hurts, I think. So, you know, for me, you know, it might take me, you know, a week to recover from a match. Uh, someone who's, you know, in their mid twenties, it might take them a day. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I started, uh, when I started training, I was only doing it, uh, I wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily think it was attainable for me to wrestle. I thought that while I was training and even when I began training, I was like, I'm not confident that my body can handle this, uh, this sort of punishment because, you know, this is well outside of my comfort zone and what I'm used to and, and sort of seems very much beyond my abilities. And so, you know... Um, uh, but slowly I sort of gained confidence and slowly I saw that even though like I'm not the most athletic person I found that you know through more more through determination than athleticism I could normally um, grasp a lot of the things that was that w were being taught and the sort of the moves and stuff that were being taught and that I found that you know, where I maybe lacked in terms of the, you know, athletic ability of some of the other people, 
I had a huge advantage of because I'd been uh, a filmmaker and I'd been acting and I'd been performing for a, a huge chunk of my life. So whereas, whereas you know, they might be able to do a, a flip bump better than me, um, I could um, register and show emotion in a, in a more... Uh, you know, plausible and believable way than they could. And so, you know, we all, and what I sort of, what you learn about wrestling and uh, as you start doing it is there's, you can be good at many different elements in pro wrestling. You don't have to be good at all of them um, to, to be able to tell good stories in the ring. And so, you know, I guess when I started, I was just purely looking at it to begin with as, as something to um, make, I, I want to, uh, make a film about pro wrestling and I wanted to understand pro wrestling from the inside out um, as opposed from the outside looking in so I really wanted to do it an experience and that's why I started training but as I continued and I sort of grew in confidence but not just grew in confidence I rekindled my own passion for you know I did originally want to be a pro wrestler before I sort of started following my filmmaking dream I was off on my pro wrestling dream so 14 15 16 I was absolutely adamant that I was going to be a pro wrestler and that I was going to wrestle in like the WWE or whatever and that was my calling and then I made a short film and I discovered this whole other passion for filmmaking and then I realized that was my calling and so doing the training sort of re-reminded me about this other thing that I loved really just as much or almost as much as movie making that I'd sort of given up on um, and I realized that I could actually do it and I could live that dream as well just not probably to the scale that I once imagined um, but that's okay because you know what you get out of wrestling does not have to be fame and fortune and it does not have to be um, you know, on this large scale, you can get just as much, or I believe, from, you know, wrestling in front of, uh, you know, small crowds, you know, between 100 and 400 people, and entertaining, or even less, you know, even in front of 20 people, 30 people, and entertaining and engaging, because it's really about the stories that you're telling, and storytelling is something that I'm deeply connected to as a filmmaker, and, you know, I was, I was actually thinking about this the other day, you know, I, I recently went over to Amsterdam where I uh, won an award for yeah. acting for my performance in my movie Older, uh, which is a feature film that I made, which took seven years to make. It was this, you know, long journey. And the awards show and the award ceremony was, you know, probably maybe as close as I'll come to the Oscars. It was this huge, beautiful theatre. Uh, it was in this beautiful European country, you know, uh, black tie event, uh, a lot of celebrities and stars there. Um, and then me and uh, and then me winning this award and which on the one hand I was like this is cool this is fantastic this is great validation for the work I do in filmmaking but you know a couple of weeks ago I wrestled uh, in the in the main event of IPW who I wrestled primarily for Impact Pro Wrestling and you know that was in front of about 180 people um, and the feeling of that the adrenaline, the feeling that you get, the rush that you get from the fans uh, when you know that they're engaged and you can hear them cheering or booing or willing you on to perform, like that feeling uh, probably felt better than me winning that award um, because there is actually something, and this is this addictive nature of pro wrestling, there's something about that feeling that you get when you perform in front of fans and you have them hooked on the story you're telling, that is, uh, you know, that there's no other replacement for. There's nothing that you can um, match it to. So you can have these great highlights in your own life, but they might not compare to those, those highlights in the ring. Um, and so for me, it was just something to acknowledge, to go, look, you know, this award was this amazing thing. However does it even compare to the rush of the crowd and the fans and the and the and those people believing in that story for that period of time and i'm not sure that it does which just goes to show why you know people put their bodies on the line to wrestle in front of small crowds why people continue to wrestle you know when maybe they should stop because that you know that adrenaline hit and that connection is you know completely unique to pro wrestling i think um, and certainly, you know, even having, you know, 
been in plays and stuff like that you know it's similar but it's not the same yeah yeah I was thinking of um, incidentally when you mentioned that I was thinking of guys like um, Christian or CM Punk you know who stepped away from the business for a bit and then when they instantly came back, the, when those lights were on, especially for Punk, who's, you know, who tried out something different in, in terms of the UFC. Yes. It wasn't the, it wasn't the same feel of that of the crowd. It was different and yeah. it was foreign for him because I remember he mentioned that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, CM Punk is, you know, a great example of uh, someone who brought me back to wrestling uh, at a certain time. And so I would say I've been through sort of, a few different phases of being a wrestling fan as well as a wrestler myself but you know my sort of fandom started when I was very little when I was five or six and I watched I saw um, SummerSlam 1989 someone had actually brought it into school um, to our primary school and essentially was playing it for show and tell and 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 we everyone was like mesmerized by these larger than life superheroes and Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man and uh, it was uh, the, uh, basically a scene where uh, part of it was a promo of the Macho Man and Zeus and um, Scary Sherry all staring into a cauldron oh, oh, yeah. and yeah, talking about uh, what they see predicting for the future of their match. And I just remember just as a kid, just like it was like the greatest thing that I'd ever seen. This was the most amazing thing that I'd ever seen. And that got me hooked. But... Uh, you know, so, uh, uh, following on from that, maybe a year or two later, uh, wrestling was banned actually because uh, so they they stopped airing wrestling in New yeah, Zealand um, uh, uh, around that sort of late eighties, early nineties time, um, and so it didn't come back in until I saw in ninety six or yeah ninety six probably. Uh, it was back on the television, and I could, I just remember seeing Hulk Hogan come out, but he was all dressed in black. Hey, I know um, to the other film. And uh, I just again like it just blew my mind because here was this all American good guy, the quintessential good guy, the quintessential yep. hero, um, you know, the 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 goodest of the good, yep. as a bad guy doing all these things that I just you know couldn't wrap my head around and i remember it was the first time i saw people interfere in another match you know like as a group and i was like you can't do that that's that's not wrestling that's against all wrestling people just can't come in and 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 so to me that was that second phase of my fandom and that's when i thought that i was going to be a pro wrestler and then again sort of followed it for a few years filmmaking became my priority lost a little bit of interest and then CM Punk and his pipe bomb promo brought me back to wrestling um, because, again, it seemed to represent me. What I felt about wrestling was what he was talking about, which is like it shouldn't be about bodybuilders and, um, you know, jacked up guys. It should be about your wrestling ability and it should be, again, about your connection to the fans and it should be uh, not what WWE prescribes but what we, the fans, want. Um, and all of that seemed to be encapsulated. We were sick, you know, of Super Cena, and we were we were, we wanted something <laughs> different. And CM Punk was that antidote to to the kind Absolutely. of the conventional yeah. stuff. And and so that reignited my passion. Um, cut to a few years later, twenty sixteen, when I started wrestling, and I saw a match between Kenny Omega and uh, Okada oh, uh, in New right. Japan, which someone just randomly shared a link. Too. and that was again like another phase of my fandom where I started uh, enjoying other wrestling outside of the American wrestling um, and that sort of really started to that really blew my mind in a different way the way that uh, New Japan stories were told um, and, and that sort of again was another phase where I, I became super passionate about watching wrestling as well as and now I was actually wrestling or training to wrestle at the same time and so those two things kind of happened simultaneously. Nice. And uh, just just thinking back that, you know, you were sharing your, your childhood, I, I, I also followed a similar path, but, I, you know, I was like, in the early 90s, I was, I, my father who had watched wrestling with his, with his, with his kids, so his, but my brothers would watch it, so when you mentioned Summer Slam 89, the first thing I mentioned was the, the madness match, so it was Hulk Hogan, British Department Beefcake, and it was Randy Savage and Zeus, and I remember the the ending part of it, which is Brutus being hung up like this above his neck, and I'm going, I'm frightened of of yes. Zeus. Yeah, you know he's he's a monster. Yes, 
And How then, are they going to stop this monster? Absolutely. He's impervious to Hulk Hogan's punches. And then they grab, <laughs> and then they grab chairs. And I remember that they grab metal chairs, and I'm going, yeah. He's not. He's not feeling it. Yeah. You know, I thought it was one chair shot. That's it. You're gone. Yeah. But he's like, yeah. And he's looking back, and I'm like, no, 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 Hogan, no. So, I followed that through, and then like yourself in the early 1986. But for me, it was on TV four. For me, it was um, watching Stone Cold, Mm. and it was that promo where he was wearing the 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 suit and tie. And Vince McMahon, I already knew who Vince McMahon was, and he's he just walks up to the ring, he's like, "Yeah, I'm a champion. Take a photo. This is the absolute last time you'll ever see this." And it stuns him, and I'm like, "He's the owner of the WWE. You yeah. can't do that, yeah. you know." It's the, it's the attitude shift, and I and, and I and I love, like you said, it's the story making. Yeah. And this is what I wanted to do with the podcast is story making. So with that said. How was your first match when you're in IPW? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's interesting because, like, actually, in some ways, my memory for my own history of pro wrestling is is not very good. And sometimes, uh, you know, I'm always kind of looking forward, um, and that's kind of what I try and do just generally. But um, so sometimes people have to remind me of matches that they've that I've had with them or that. Um, or that we've had together or something like that. But I do do remember my first matches, um, which were on an Armageddon show. So IPW, and still does, uh, but uh, we used to specifically run the Armageddons, which means essentially we would be sent to the Armageddons and would put on a show in the afternoons or uh, maybe three shows in the afternoons. Uh, and it wasn't really for true wrestling people because people with Armageddon are just passing through. You know, they're just, you know, they're going to buy some comics or they're going to see um, someone else. They're not necessarily there to see wrestling, but it's, you know, a spectacle, it's entertainment. And so people will kind of gather around the ring as we as we did the shows. And so that would often be a way that they would um, debut or test uh, new wrestlers, oh, wow. new people who are yeah. training because the stakes are lower than a main show where if you essentially, you know, uh, can we swear on this podcast? Yeah, you? why not? Uh, if if we shit the bed, yeah, then um, you know uh, that's a bigger problem because we've now potentially alienated some of our local fans that are, are likely to not maybe not come back the next time. Yeah. So these Armageddon shows were part of the initiation process for new wrestlers cool. to see if okay these guys are all right maybe we can put them on a main show down the road. Yeah. And so mine was my first one was in Wellington. Um, and I remember, you know, again, being just incredibly, incredibly nervous. Um, and that feeling of, um, sort of stage fright and sort of going through like the things you've learned in the mood and, you know, normally the matches are short. Uh, I wrestled, um, uh, I think I wrestled two matches to begin with, which was, can't remember which was first, but I essentially wrestled three times that day. Um, two singles, one was against the shooter Shane Sinclair and the other one was against Chad Howard so there were two sort of Wellington based wrestlers who were much more experienced yeah. and they were sort of like cool tell me what you do and I'd be like well uh, you know I, uh, I do a punch or I, yeah, I, I do the sort of full away slam or I, uh, or I maybe I drop an elbow and they're like cool that's your one thing and then I'm just going to beat you up for the remainder of this uh, and then I'm going to win. You know, that's basically the story of these these matches when you're beginning. You, you don't get too much in because also your offense may not look very convincing. Absolutely. So, you know, it's all about selling, uh, selling being when you get beat up, basically, um, and sort of you're, you're in these sort of what they call squash matches where these short matches where you just kind of get beat up and lose. That's how yeah. it happens, but... For that, they sort of get to see you as a wrestler. Will you be too nervous to perform? You know, will you freeze up in the ring? Will you be dangerous and hurt someone? All of those things can be sort of assessed afterwards. And so I did those I did those two matches, and then I did a tag team match um, with someone where we were sort of the bad guys, and um, and, and that, that was my first three. And, yeah, all I can just remember was being just incredibly, incredibly nervous um, all the way, the whole day leading up to it, while I was in the ring, while I was doing stuff, even though I wasn't doing very much, 
um, you know, and you know, you remember little things like I went to drop an elbow, but um, the person rolled the way the wrong way, oh, so the no. way not the wrong way necessarily, but I was expecting them to rest, uh, to roll the other way to miss with the elbow so yeah. I almost kind of hit them with the elbow that I was meant to miss yeah. you know you just remember random stuff like that um, but those were my sort of that was my first thing and then I guess maybe a month or two later I, I started having those kind of shorter matches on shows and then that went from having shorter matches on shows to slightly longer more competitive matches um, but you know essentially the first year that I wrestled I was just essentially what you define as enhancement talent, as in as someone that, that makes the other person look good, really. Yeah. I'm putting over the other person. It's not really about me. Um, it's just about the continuation of their storylines and I'm just a guy there to essentially get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that was... Uh, and then we, I sort of became a tag team and that, that's when we started to have success and grow and develop. With a, I was in a tag team with a uh, fellow uh, wrestler... IPW trainee Will Stone um, and we formed uh, Savage and Stone because my wrestling uh, persona is Alex Savage um, and uh, that tag team begin, began to take off we ran, uh, we won the, the IPW tag team titles and it sort of went from there so along with, along with all your you know you mentioned enhancement, enhancement um, talent it reminds me of the story with the, I think it was one of the young bucks who faced off Kurt Angle and Kurt Angle went into the back and went, don't, eat, don't try anything fresh with me. I know a counter for every move, so don't even think about it. And Nick went, don't want to screw it. I'm going I'm to just grab catering and just leave after this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah well, nothing like that happened with me. So, <laughs> like, you know, uh, most people, I think, uh, you know, and the more experienced people you wrestle, uh, you some of them understand that if you just beat someone up um for five minutes and then win that's actually not very interesting that's not interesting for the fans and you know as they say if you just beat me up for five minutes and then won who did you beat whereas if the match is competitive if the match is uh you know sort of uh contested and you believe that i might be able to win and you have that idea oh he might actually get him that is far more engaging for Absolutely. an audience. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the more experienced wrestlers or I guess the more perhaps maybe less selfish wrestlers understand that and sort of would let me do more stuff and let me show off my thing before I would ultimately lose, you know? Yeah. yeah. So how is it like um, going on the road? After, like, after all the wrestling is done and you you got to face these other guys who's just being you how how was the you know how was the interaction with the other wrestlers and did you go on to like uh, like roadie um roadie drives down to the next yeah yeah i mean absolutely so obviously armageddon took us all over the place wellington christchurch dunedin um and you know a group of the wrestlers would travel um from there in terms of like um in terms of the wrestlers that I work with you know you become like a little bit of a family um and you do all work together you do all train together and even the people that sort of are very experienced and don't train anymore start to get to know you after a few shows and so I remember that like and now I know this as someone who's more experienced is that to when rookies who we call rookies introduce themselves you don't really care. <laughs> you don't really clock it because you're not sure that they're going to be around. You, you, because actually you have to have like a very high level of commitment to wrestling. Yeah. Even wrestling independently, you know, for little to no money um, is, you know, you, you're you going to have to be around for one to two years before you even make your debut. That's just training. That's just grinding it out, you know, one, two, three times a week before you even get the opportunity to step in the ring. And and so you actually have to have a lot of willpower and staying power, and that's obviously assuming you don't get injured and all that sort of thing. So when you see new rookies, or when I see new rookies now, it's like, look, if I see this guy in six months, then I will definitely make sure to kind of get to know him a little bit more and be more invested in him. But right now, he could be gone next week. Yeah. You know, he could be gone next show. Um, and so you sort of you you wondered at the beginning why 
these kind of people didn't take an interest in what you were doing and you know the short answer is just because they they weren't sure whether they needed to or not Um, but as you stick around all those people start coming to you and giving you advice helping you with uh you know um working through and improving getting better when they see you know your own commitment and uh in terms of those road trips they're actually the most i love going on those trips they're the sort of the most fun that you can have wrestling uh is is sort of going on those trips to some small town and wrestling you know probably not in front of huge crowds but you know sometimes um and you know you know i had some amazing experience wrestling for sbw in dunedin um that was certainly like something that i had a huge amount of fun with and we we traveled to invercargill um to to wrestle a couple of tag matches down there that was that was really awesome and uh, and then you know i've sort of gone all, all around the uh the north island uh wrestling for you know other companies like um pwe and um you know maniacs and and those types of um companies as well um or bringing our show elsewhere and so you know that's fun it's just a huge time commitment that's yeah. all um because you know you 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 know you have to set up the ring so that means packing down the ring putting it in the truck driving to wherever the place is and maybe that drive is you know a couple of hours away setting up the ring having the show packing down the ring and driving back and then unpacking the ring again so it's 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 not just we're all just showing up at the venue ready to wrestle it's like we're showing up uh you know we're showing up at 11 a.m um to start that process you know that prep eh? yeah yeah so you mentioned that you're you're a tag champion yes how is it um how's the scheduling and how is it like holding a title because i i can i can't imagine because i know when you look at uh, people like um currently like roman reigns who holds the title yeah um uh just trying to think of another one um well i'll, I'll just pick will Ospreay for the united states title yeah they would have a more um more harder uh schedule because of the of the, what they're holding at the moment so how was that yeah so well that was i guess the case is that when you have a title with one company it's more likely that the other companies will want to book you because there is like even though wrestling is not real and uh these titles are given to you you are uh, you don't win them legitimately and you know us as wrestlers should remember that sometimes we're not really you know uh we need to sort of take a step back sometimes but on the same token that being given any kind of titles is an investment as in we the company believe in you or your team um that you guys are uh good enough to be our champions that you guys are going to represent us well as champions and so that isn't something to like while i say check your ego at the door it's still also not something to take completely lightly Lightly, either that means something because there are plenty of wrestlers who don't get an opportunity to be champion within their companies um and it reflects you know probably a connection with the crowd a degree of popularity if you're a baby face or a, a degree of uh you know being uh, adequately hated if you're a heel um and so it is you know a proud thing it was a very proud moment for us we started off essentially as an enhancement tag team so we started off as a jobbers as as people who were just consistently putting over and making other tag teams look good but within that our popularity was growing and people were wanted to see us win so then we started winning they wanted to see that more and then it went from that to you know we were having a real connection with the fans people were starting to be really invested in us as a tag team and then we got that tag team championship and yes that did allow us to uh wrestle um, for other companies and sort of tell some fun and interesting stories you know, uh, an S- uh, SPW and PWE and stuff like that, um, which was uh, super cool. So, you know, the schedule, but the schedule only increases if you want it to. Yeah. So you don't have to say yes to any of that stuff, right? Damn. Um, yeah. That's on you whether you want to wrestle for other promotions. Um, so I went through my busiest schedule period actually before I was tag team when I was sort of wrestling every weekend. Um uh, and I've sort of since cut back. Now I wrestle only, you know, one to two times a month. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you want it, and if you're prepared to go out and put yourself out there, and if you're prepared to do what the other companies want you to do, then you do have the ability to wrestle 
you know, potentially every weekend um, should you choose to. And yes, if you're a, a champion, you're more likely to have that opportunity more often, I suppose. Sweet. And so you, you got the tag titles. Um, how did you drop those titles? And what happened afterwards? Well, it's kind of a funny story because, you know, I think personally we lost the tag titles uh, about a year before we should have. Oh, yeah. And I don't mean that as in like I'm bitter or, or I feel bad <laughs> about it. We lost them for... Uh, several reasons one reason was that my tag team partner was heading was going to be heading over to australia to live okay so obviously that creates a problem we can't be a tag team if he doesn't live here in new zealand right yeah. um so that was one issue the other issue was that i needed a hip surgery um i had uh, torn i had a torn labrum which was causing me uh significant problems even though i could still wrestle with it it was something that needed to be repaired um uh, otherwise, it was going to, you know, get worse and worse. And so, you know, obviously that recovery period for me was going to be a, a sort of a minimum of six months. And so with those two things factored in, um, we were sort of, and we were completely transparent. He wants to go to Australia. I'm going to have to go away and have the surgery and recover. We can't be the tag team champions anymore. So, you know, this is the time that we have to, to lose them. Excuse me. So um, that was, you know, that was the primary reason. And then that turned into a feud between myself and him. And ultimately, he did not end up going to Australia. He still works here. Will Stone is uh, <laughs> still wrestling uh, hey. uh, up and down the country. And, and so it led to the feud between us, which was to conclude with a loser leaves town match yep. when he leaves town. Uh, but then he never left town. So actually that meant that that storyline got extended and then obviously things like COVID and stuff like that yeah. meant that things were put on pause and then, you know, ultimately it, it ended up for the best. One, because I think Will's a great guy and I'm glad that he stayed in New Zealand and he's a great wrestler and, you know, he... So we're richer for having him stay and just as as a friend of mine, I'm richer for having him stay. Yes. Um, but also, you know, it all kind of worked out in a more interesting way in some ways. But I would have just liked to have had that storyline with a, a year longer to establish our reign as the as the sort of the premier tag team in New yeah, Zealand to yeah. make that turn and that impact even more meaningful. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so... Are you, are you still wrestling, is that right? Or are you just, is it on an ongoing? No, that's right. I'm still wrestling. So I, I wrestle only, so I used to wrestle for many different companies. Now I just wrestle for one or two. Um, the main one being IPW, which yeah. is obviously where I started, where I trained. And, you know, that is my family. So obviously I'll always be wrestling for them. Um, Will and I just had a huge uh, blow off last man standing match um, at the last uh, at our last uh, show, which was a couple of weeks ago, which you know was you know uh, pretty intense, but amazing way to sort of finish that story. That's cool. Um, and uh, you know, so I do wrestle. I I do love wrestling. I just wrestle less than I did kind of prior to my surgeries because you know my body just can't take wrestling every weekend and also to be honest you know my life is very full uh and i have a lot of other interesting things that i need to do and you know while i love wrestling i understand that i am only ever going to be a new zealand indie wrestler and i'm 100 percent okay with that but i don't think that i'm going to be uh an, a new zealand indie filmmaker uh i think that you know yes i'm going to be that but I'm going to be much more in my filmmaking career. And so, you know, I need to allocate a certain amount of time to the thing that I can have a, a long and prosperous career with as opposed to the thing I love doing, but, you know, my body's wearing out and, uh, and I'm old, you know, I'm old for a, a wrestler uh, or older for a wrestler. And, you know, it's something that I do just for the appreciation and fun of it, the love of it. Um, as opposed to something that makes me money, and I do have to be conscious of trying to make money. Yeah, um, yeah. fair enough. And 
what is, what are, what is your advice you would give because uh, to a person like myself who want, who would want to get into pro wrestling? Yeah, okay, uh, that's a great question, Vinny. I think that there's a couple of things to think about, um, but in terms of like you know, as is the case for many things, it's not actually necessarily about how good you are, but how determined you are, and so it's fine to you know like. Um, I have seen some incredibly gifted, athletically gifted people who you look at and go, they're going to be a great wrestler one day, but they couldn't stick at it. They couldn't stick at it. Um, you know, maybe that's injury, uh, maybe that's other priorities, whatever. Um, but like I said, it's so, you know, the the people that wind up being very successful wrestlers, especially at an independent level, aren't necessarily the best but they are certainly the most committed. And so, you know, I would say go to a training school, you know, like IPW training school. I'd say start at a training school. Start doing the training. Um, see how your body feels. And then, you know, be realistic. But if it's something that you, you're you super passionate about, you love and you care about and you're still enjoying, then... Um, you just have to be committed to that training. You have to understand that in, in some ways it's almost like uh, on a micro level, it's just like trying to make it to the WWE, except you're just trying to make it onto a New Zealand wrestling show. Yeah. You know, it's it's actually like that uh, uh, on a sort of a micro level because you're still going to have to train for, for uh, you know, hundreds of hours. No one is going to trust you until you can prove that you can be safe in the ring. Absolutely. Uh, you have to check your ego at the door. You know, you are going to come in. You're not going to come. Like, that's the thing. I think a lot of people that want to be wrestlers come in and think they're going to be pushed to the moon, right? They're just going to come in and they're just going to beat everyone on the roster. Realistically, uh, it's going to be quite the opposite of that. Um, they're going to come in and they're going to lose a lot until the point that the, their company trusts them enough to have them start beating all the people that have already proven that, yeah. that have already shown their commitment, that have been doing this for years, that have already uh, been a part of that company and made that company, you know, what it is, build up that audience, connected with those fans. So, you know, you're a very long way, and I'm not saying you specifically, but everyone is a very long Absolutely. way from where they want to be, which is like stone cold giving out stunners to everyone as they, you know, pile in the ring. Yeah. Like that will come... But just understand that, you know, that, you know, like, for instance, just take me, for example, although I've been, uh, you know, a tag team champion and a Maniacs United Shield holder um, and have been involved in some like, uh, you know, really cool stories and feuds. The last show two weeks ago, this is six years into my career, was the first main event I had wrestled for IPW. Damn. So, you know, this is a six-year journey just in. That's not me being champion. That's literally just being given the opportunity to finish the show, to, to close to the show. To close, damn. Um, was, has been, you know, essentially six years just to get to that point. So you just have to understand that it does take time and the, the best thing you can be is committed to that journey um and not i guess you know really do check your ego at the door Absolutely. you know that's the thing is like you want to learn to wrestle you want to learn all this stuff well you're going to have amazing teachers and you have a whole bunch of people all supporting you to do that but don't think that yeah you're going to be roman reigns uh you're going to come in goldberg style and have this long undefeated streak uh you know that's not how it's going to work no um but if you're committed and you stick at it, you'll watch everyone else drop away, and then you'll be that person that's given those opportunities. Absolutely. Where can we find you? Well, I guess the, the best way to find us is uh, Impact Pro Wrestling New Zealand on, on Facebook. I mean, that's where you can see all our events, which we hold sort of monthly or around thereabouts. Um, and we do also have a, a website, which I believe is impactwrestling.co.nz, uh, I hope. Um, and that's but that's where we announce all our events and you can see uh, stuff um, you can find me I think uh, is, I think I'm just a savage on Instagram or Alex Savage on Instagram I will be honest I'm actually very lazy with the socials when it comes <laughs> to promoting my 
uh, my wrestling um, because uh, I, I don't really know why. I, I've just, uh, you know, I guess I'm always thinking about promoting stuff and all that sort of thing, but I don't, I like to do it less for um, wrestling, even though I still, you know, help create content for IPW and stuff like yeah. that. Um, it's just, I just like promoting myself personally less. Um, but yeah, so that's where you can find us. Best face is probably on um, Facebook. Awesome. Thank you so much, Guy. My pleasure, Vinny. Or should I say Alex? Thank you so much. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll see you in class tomorrow. Hey, oh, 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 dear. Hope I don't get a backbreaker for out. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. So see you in the next one. The following announcement has been paid for by the Shoot House Podcast.